Hi everybody, um, with me on my YouTube video, I have Simon Rollo on the 12th of June, Saturday morning at about four o'clock. He's going to tee off from the Riviera Resort at Three Rivers for the 1,000 miler challenge, the Massive Adventures 1,000 miler challenge to Cape Town. Um, it's mostly gravel just south of Sasselberg. He'll climb on the gravel. And um, we've designed the route to be as gravel as possible all the way to just outside Cape Town, 1,000 miles later or 1,600 kilometers later. Um, he's going to, the idea is to do it as fast as you can, obviously. Well, for him it is. Um, he's a racing snake, youngster and all the rest, or relative youngster compared to the rest of us. And um, yeah, it's uh, hopefully he'll get some good weather in between cold fronts. Um, and it's unsupported. The main that's that's the main thing. It's an unsupported challenge. Um, people, there's no there's no marshals on the route. It's 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 a, a an informal sort of challenge. But you know it's, it's expected that honesty prevail and he adheres to the rules. And um, so it's unsupported. Uh, carries his own kit with him. We'll delve now into his plan, his kit, his bicycle and all the interesting stuff that you might like to learn. So Simon, let's kick it off quickly. Um, just tell us a brief bit about yourself. Um, the, your, your, I guess, you know, with all these type of things, one try, tries to train hard, but you've got you've got a working life and you've got a family life. So tell us about yourself. We know you're from Richards Bay. That's, um, take, take it away. All right, well, basically, I'm, as you say, I'm from Richards Bay. I'm a accountant by day, a cyclist, normally by weekend and uh, night night riding and morning training wherever I can. But yeah, it, uh, the love for the sport has basically grown. I've started obviously as a pleb where we start with all these shorter rides, gone through, done some quite a few shorter type races to start. And as the love for the sport has grown, I've literally uh, developed into a longer distance type of, of sort of had a passion for the longer type distance which is where which has set me into you know entering these type of rides you know into the longer type distances tell us about some of the longer distance races that you've done prior to this well andy won't enjoy uh, my first comment but yeah obviously the the famous m word gets thrown around which is the manga that's yeah. probably the, the longer one that i've done apart from doing the thousand miler two years ago but I've done quite a few uh, longer type rides from the Trans Bobbians through to the 361. So anything over about 200 Ks, that's where I start getting the passion for wanting to go and, and tackle these type of rides. So, so anything, you know, it's got to be a longer type distance to really get me to want to go out and actually, you know, take take the, on the challenge. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's uh, great. So I guess the 94.7 isn't high on your agenda at the, the, these days. Um, no, not this <laughs> Now, let's get into it. Um, the, your, your, your plan, roughly, how many days do you plan to take to Cape Town? If all goes well, I know that this is a hazardous business. Weather can count against you. You can have technicals or you can you know, have overuse injuries. But if all goes well, what's plan A? Well, my, my plan has changed probably four times since I started my original plan. From the curfews that have changed with the uh, old president, uh, adjusting the curfews up and down with the latest one being adjusted about a week ago so whereas i could have gone to about midnight i now have to try and get indoors around about 11 o'clock you know and then leave the next morning around about four o'clock so although the curfew is not really ideal you know it still offers a sense of getting a little bit of sleep in so i think the president's looking out for the sleeping monsters that the gremlins that you need to try and over, overcome and then as well as yeah obviously you'd spend as much time as you can on the bike uh, apart from that okay. so looking yeah looking really yeah so, so if there was no curfew um in a in a sort of pre-covid situation what would your your first day well how, how far would you plan to go on your first day probably well if there if there was no real curfew you could probably really go right through the night and try and get maybe 100 or 200 k's past bloom you know if you had the ideal conditions without curfew maybe get close towards uh, probably edinburgh or, or transburg or somewhere in that 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 region to you know or even yeah. go as far as Kharib dam if you can you know i mean i've done 
the manga grit where we did a 500k non-stop within 26 hours so it's all possible but you got to look at the long-term gain so if it's a 500k race you can just cycle all the way through and get to the finish whereas if you're going to now take on a challenge of a thousand six hundred k's you sort of need to pace yourself over a four to five you know a, a minimum four day but probably in the region of about a five day type type route yeah. so you might you might have gone as far as you might go as far as Bloemfontein on the first day in a in a, an ideal situation and have a well, that's why i'm still i'm still hoping to possibly uh, get close to the Bloemfontein uh but up uh, area but i'll only know once i get near winburg that, that'll sort of set set the time because that's i'm having to go a little bit heavier due to the, the cold weather so i'm having to pack a lot heavier which although it will slow you down a little bit it's still not you know you, you're still gonna ride at a, at a fairly comfortable pace get through all the different towns fill up your bottles have a have a minor little rest uh, recharge the batteries for a few minutes get some food and then obviously meander on further down so once I get sort of into Winburg, that'll give me an idea. If I can get in there before five o'clock, have a 20 minute rest, half an hour rest max in Winburg and try and get out of there just after five, I'm still on track to get into Bloemfontein by about 11 o'clock to get in there by that curfew. So that's that's first prize. Okay, so Winburg would be about a 290 odd K. 287, K. yeah. And, 287, uh, call it 290. Yeah. yeah, and if you were to get to Bloemfontein, that would be a pretty respectable 400 odd K day, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 405, that's right. So if I can get to Bloemfontein, that sets me up to possibly go near the five day, just under five day. Uh, but if, if I can only get into Winburg, that's going to probably set me back a little bit, probably by five hours, which then could put it just past the five day mark. You know, so that's it's all it's all set up based on how day one finishes because from Winburg to Bloemfontein there isn't really much accommodation so I can't really push an extra 30 or 40 or 50 k's like I, I sort of look look towards doing I have to either make a decision to stick back and hold back in Winburg or go through to Bloemfontein because right. that's the 120 k gap now so and you're not like some of the bike packers you don't take your bivy in your tent and sleep in the bush with you you hot foot it to the nearest town and try and get a good sleep in a b and I gather yeah, I think if it was summer, you could probably take the risks and take a bit of a chance. But Bloemfontein being minus seven this past week, looking at the, the, the storms, uh, weather, weather, Facebook pages, you know, these, these, the temperatures in the Free State and the Northern Cape at the moment are pretty icy. So that's prompted me to, to sort of pack a little bit heavier. I've borrowed some kit from old Jack Black that's done the Freedom quite a bit. And yeah, he's, he's given me quite a bit of decent winter gear but obviously winter gear comes with a bit of a, uh, a penalty of, uh, of the weight that you have to carry so i'm having to, to add an extra bag to the front of the handlebars just to accommodate all this extra gear that i'm going to have to carry which is not still, ideal still probably pretty light how many kilograms would you estimate your whole kit is with i don't know how many liters of water are you going to take for in between towns yeah, so I've got four water bottles. I'm not, okay. like the first time I did the thousand mile, I actually had a camel pack, which, you know, uh, for me, I don't really like enjoying riding with a camel pack, just, you know, because obviously having the extra weight on your back. So I'd rather do, doing this in the winter, you don't really drink as much as when you're out in the heat in the summer months. So that's, that's the positive side of doing it in the winter. So I can leave the camel pack at home, take four water bottles, which is more than enough. And yeah, that should get me between each town, you know, as you go through each town, which is normally about 80 to 80 to 100 Ks maximum apart. Those four bottles will get me through to those towns, get into the town, fill up, get some food and then head on to the next town. So that's the, the ideal. Plan. So with, with the four water bottles and all your kit, have you got an estimate of roughly how many kilograms it is on the bike that you carry? It's probably in the region of about seven kgs of extra weight. If I add up everything from from the bottles to the the extra, well, mainly the kit because yeah, I'm having to take extra, you know, charges for the lights, yeah. for the garments, etc., that type of thing. And I've even got that extra garment battery pack that'll keep the garment at least charged a lot longer than what the battery would normal hold normally hold. Yeah, yeah. So and um, and the bike. Describe the bike. What's the what's yeah? Well, I'm riding. I'm riding a Kevin Benkham style special curve a gravel bike. Yeah. I've put on the, the Lauf uh, front suspension, which will soften the blows in terms of the, the gravel uh, ride. I've got the AXS electronic shifters, so that's a slight weight saving in terms of having the, the, the cable shifting, which is 
very smooth. I've written it now for a few months and I'm highly impressed. I'm quite thankful to, to Kevin for setting that all up for me. So I'm enjoying the gravel bike. And yeah, the reason I've sort of chosen to go for the gravel over my, my uh, Specialized is purely because of the extra space I have by not having that extra shock underneath the, the so I can actually actually carry an extra bag for extra bars and extra goos and things like that that'll allow me to, to, to pack in a few extra things. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. I prefer to have that rear suspension for my butter. Well, on those corrugated <laughs> roads, but okay, each to yeah. their own. Um, okay, Simon, so now, and, and, and you're not going to pack anything on your back, I gather, is it all on your frame? Everything's going to be on your frame? Everything's going to be on the bike, yeah. So I've got my tracker, uh, the lights, everything's all packed, ready to go. I'm the bike sitting uh, right behind me as I go. It's all packed. I'm just going to put it in the car and literally leave tomorrow and then head up to Joburg and get to the start. So, okay. yeah, well, I'm all good. Yeah, I know it, it probably makes sense to have it all on your frame. I know the Freedom Challenges like backpacks, but they have to climb the odd fence every now and then. So, that yeah, we don't have to do yeah. that. Um, tell me, and... Um, so you haven't got down to the nitty gritty. I know you always, guys always try and be modest and humble and try and avoid this question, but plan A, how many days to Bloberg? Well, I'm, ideally, I'd like to get near the five day. If I can go slightly under, that'll be ideal. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to obviously see how the weather the weather goes. Normally June, the, the wind's not too much into, into us. So that's normally the positive. Normally May, June, you sort of could have a tailwind. That, but it'll all depend on the day. So when I did this ride about three weeks ago, you know, when I met up with you, I actually had a, a massive headwind into Windberg for the last 130 Ks, and that probably held me back at least half an hour. So yeah. if I get another headwind like that, that could prompt me to have to hold back at Windberg. But if the, the conditions get ideal and I can get into Bloemfontein, that probably would set me up for a sub five day, you know, if, if all the rest of the days uh, continue nicely the way, I've, the way I'm sort of hoping and planning it will yeah, one always has to be flexible, I guess, with that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, you just never. Yeah, no, under five days is great. But now you've done you've done the thousand mile. When you used to have that race that Andy used to to organise, you did the thousand miler and you you did it comfortably in under five days that time round. So what's the difference this time round? You know, I think being a lot more on gravel. I mean, the first six hundred k's into Colesburg was pretty much on top. I mean, myself, we were a group of four when we did it. Myself, Sarah, Bryce, and Sean four, uh, two years ago. We were literally averaging almost 30 Ks all the way into, into Kronstadt the first couple of hours. So, I mean, you're not going to be able to sit there and averaging that type of speeds on, on gravel. So, automatically, the gravel is definitely going to slow you down by a couple of hours. Uh, yeah, I'm expecting at least that, especially since even leaving uh, Bloemfontein and heading towards Colesburg, going through Kharip and that, it's all... A lot of it's going to be gravel road compared to two years ago when right up until Colesburg was pretty much tar. So it's definitely going to, I mean, there's probably a six to eight hour penalty, I would think, just that portion alone, you know, just before you get to Colesburg. Yeah. Now, the logistics is interesting with this thing. Um, tell us what your plans are in terms of riding times and starting times, because a lot of those towns close down just after dark in the evenings and you arrive there too late and you're not getting supper. Yeah, so in terms of logistics, one has to be a little bit more flexible. So when you're going through towns, some of those towns, you get to the smaller little towns that close two, three in the afternoon. Yeah, you've got to try and find a garage. You're going to not get probably a lot of hot real meals apart from the odd garage pie, which yeah, is never a nice experience. The garage pies. They don't knock the garage pies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I experienced it in Henneman about three weeks ago. The garage pie there was, yeah, not not of the best quality, and yeah, was a little bit on the yeah, a little bit on the difficult side to swallow. So most of the places I, I don't mind the odd garage pie that still fills the stomach and stuff, but, but yeah, you're obviously not going to get uh, big KFCs and, and uh, McDonald's and all those going through towns like Lochton and Fraserburg and that. I mean, those are going to be. You need to try and catch those places in the day if you can. Uh, to try and at least, what you, what well, you're trying to say is you need a bit of a strong stomach to handle this race. It's not just about strong legs. Yeah. Now you. I mean, that's all, the nutrition and the racing. You know, you got to fuel your body. So if you fill it with 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 nonsense, yeah, you're obviously not going to have a, a great ride. So you want to feel it, fill it, feel it as good as you can to you know really set the body up to actually handle these type of conditions. Because the long term plan is to try and get out by four get to whatever the destination is before 11. 
the big the big difference is when you when you get to a place by like eight o'clock and you know you need four hours to the next place you sort of need to hold back so that sets you back another three hours so it's not just one or two hours that you could be set back i mean if i get into winburg let's say by six and i can't get into Bloemfontein that night i'm theoretically losing about four hours that i could have been on the bike instead of getting into Bloemfontein. So it's not just a one or two hour delay. You sh it yeah. has a knock on effect for the rest of the ride. Sure, yeah, the curfew is a bit of a pain, but- um, yeah. Yeah. But we'll adapt to that. And the curfew in Bloemfontein is probably not to be, can't take risks with that. Um, and your nutrition, so your nutrition basically, as I'm understanding it from you, is just shovel whatever you can find down your throat or, or do you have- Well, I've got- I've got a lot of energy bars. Um, I've already pre-booked at the Riviera my breakfast. So normally, I mean, breakfast at the hotel is normally seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. I've already pre-booked it. They're going to give bring it up to my room that, that night that I sleep there. So at least when I wake up at three in the morning, I can have a proper breakfast before I leave. So I'm already sort of fueled for the first half of the race. Hopefully get into Edenville 130 k's later and then stop off at that little garage there try and find at least something to eat in there and then once i get into stainless get through to that uh, lombardo's and, and get in get some some little meal in there uh, and just top up the bottles before heading heading through towards ventersburg and aldam and all that area so yeah you, you definitely want to get some good food in okay and, no, and normally when you you know just through the year when you're training and stuff like that do you do any uh sort of dietary plan i know there's some guys who believe in low low carb high fat diets and getting fat adapted or whatever before the race they believe that that helps you in this do you yeah. do anything like that well when i've done the previous manga and the, the thousand miler previously i actually went on a, a vegan diet for about uh, pro probably two to three months previously mm. where i went vegan and then uh, also mainly uh, uh off the meats and I, I i switched my protein over to things like lentils chickpeas be different types of beans, those type of uh, proteins to try and just lean up a bit. I mean, when I did it two years ago, I actually dropped about 13 kgs in, in the space of about, you know, three months just to get down to a, a, a really lean weight. But then actually the downside to that is you lose a bit of power, you know, when you, when you, when you lean down too much, it, you actually, you know, I felt it in the race that I'd actually overdone it. Yeah. Whereas a race like this, you actually don't want to lean down too much. You still want to have that strength. You, and I mean, you don't want to be a skinny, skinny guy, really just trying to get down and, and do long distance riding like this. So for me, you actually want a bit of extra, uh, you know, <laughs> kgs or a little bit of extra muscle on, uh, yeah. that'll allow you to at least burn the calories. You know, whereas if you burn, you, you, you drop all that weight and that you don't, you, you don't really have the extra extra fats and stuff stored to you know you need to to be filling up fueling refueling yeah. quite continuously yeah yeah okay and 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 tell us about your training um any fancy stuff do you do all this fancy interval stuff and high intensity stuff or you're a long slow distance dude um yeah good what, what, what yeah so training? i've got a watt bike at home uh i mainly use that in the week i try and get in one two hours a day if i can uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge the last couple of months because i've come off a bit of an injury with my ITB since I rode Munger last year. So the training, the first half of the uh, half of the year wasn't quite as productive as the last maybe month or two where I've really gotten on the bike, gone out and done my 200s on the weekends, uh, got back on the watt bikes, doing my, my night session. So I've started in the last month or two to put it, I'm not quite where I'd like to be, but you know, I've, I've had to make a decision to get the ride done now with, with the, the time that I do have available. So I'm not quite where I'd like to be, but I, I still feel I'm still confident enough to, to go down and still ride it and, you know, have a bit of enjoyment, but yeah, suffer suffer a bit at the same time. So, but in terms of the training, yeah, I've at least put in quite a bit of effort these last couple of weeks to try and get in the endurance, get time in the saddle, get the butt used to being in that saddle for 10 or 12 hours on a day. So uh, I'm like feeling fairly confident. What would zone would it be? Something like tempo zone or something like that, sort of lo lower. Yeah, I try and sit yeah. between the sixty and the seventy percent uh, heart rate when I'm doing uh, endurance riding. So intervals is all fine if you want to get your heart rate up and you want to try and burn some calories and lose the odd little kg or two. Try, you know, if you want to improve your general fitness, and high interval training is always the the best option. But when it comes to 
now tacking on a, an adventure or a, or a challenge like this, you need to have time in the saddle because at the end of the day, the, the butt has to sit on that saddle. And if you're not sitting, you know, doing the longer sessions, come day three, come day four, that's when you're going to feel it. Not on the first day, not really on the second day, but once you get to day three, four and five, when, when you've been putting in these efforts for 15, 16, 17 hours a day, that's when the body starts to feel it. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're sort of conditioned to sitting on that saddle for, for quite long, long time, long periods of the day. Sure. So it's quite a hectic life for you. You train long hours, you work long hours, you've got a wife and how many kids? I've got two kids and I mean, Dylan, I mean, he does powerlifting. So we sit in the, in the gym at night as well, spending an hour and a half to two hours with his, with his weightlifting, which has actually helped me in terms of getting my core and my back strength and all that. So I'm also in the gym with him as well. So the morning I try and put towards my cycling at four in the morning, try and do an hour or two in the morning, got my full day job. And then, yeah, then the night shift starts with gymming and helping with homework and, yeah, and I think the odd what what bike session. So it's yeah. I mean, my my days. I, I, if that, I maybe get five hours of sleep in a night. In any case, so I'm used to not really getting the big sleep. And so, which has probably conditioned me to be able to get get through to the eleven to four o'clock. Because if I can get those four or five hours sleep in, that's my normal day anyway. So it's not going to make much of a difference where I'm going to be sleep deprived uh, like you'd normally be. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're happy with little sleep. You're a better man than me in that regard. And um, tell me, and then um, just some of your equipment. Your do you run a Dynamo Hub? I, I don't know if you mentioned that, or do you are you just running battery? You know, rechargeable. No, uh, just batteries. Yeah. Well, I've got the the extreme lights. So I've got the those batteries that last 50, 60 hours. So for me, I don't really need a Dynamo Hub. I've got the that spare Garmin battery pack that connects onto my edge. So that helps the battery on the on the Garmin lasts an extra day or two without having to really do too much charging. But I've still got the chargers and everything, and you know you've got to have a backup because yeah. at yeah. the end of the day, if you don't have your lights working, you can't really cycle at night. That's going to limit me. So I need to make sure that everything's charged every night when I have those four or five hours to sleep. Get everything charged, ready for the next day. So in terms of equipment, it's really just the bike. Uh, I've got the the like, all the the gearings. I've put my Eagle XX1 Gold cassettes and all that stuff. I've, Got the whole bike serviced, ready to go. Reslime the tires. It's all brakes and all that's ready to go. So the so the bike should be in top top condition, ready to take on the challenge like this. And then yeah. purely it's just down to the rider getting on and getting it done. And then you've got a spot tracker of your own, I believe. So we're going to get good tracking probably all the way to to Cape Town for the dot watchers. Yeah, my my wife uh, for my birthday a bit earlier in February decided uh, she wants to be able to track me every now and again when I go out and do rides and yeah, I said to her I'm definitely going to take on the Milo again this year so yeah she got me the spot tracker we've tested it uh, Gary's already connected it to the website and he says it's all working so yeah I don't foresee any problems battery battery life is good so, so yeah I'm expecting it to last all the way widow. she's trying her best to become a cycling widow then wow Okay, you like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about uh, when I come back is at least my, my wife will introduce my kids to me to show me uh, this is the dad, yeah, this is your dad, you know, because I'm more, always away doing these long rides. Yeah. And um, just on the, on, the, on, the, on the road, when you, when you to pace yourself, do you ride by heart rate during the race or does you just... Well, I've got a power meter, so I try and stick to normally a, a specific wattage. So when you do long distance, I try and go in between about 180 and 200 watts. Obviously, when you're climbing, it, it peaks up a little bit, you know, downhills at all. But when you, when you try and do endurance, I try not to go too much over the 200 watts, uh, you know, long distance wise, just to, to try and keep a specific. But I've got my heart rate monitor on, uh, which will also keep an, keep an eye. So, you know, you, you sort of focus on a couple of different factors. You know, the speed of the Garmin, you know, your average speed also especially when the free the free state the first part of the race is fairly flat so you can you try and stick to a specific average that you want once you start getting nearer cape town where you got all the climbing and that obviously the average then fluctuates quite quite dramatically but when you're doing the first half of the race where it's fairly fairly consistent you can actually set yourself sort of an average speed to try and maintain over over a certain period yeah yeah excellent sure and uh, sort of getting to the end here, Simon, are we going to see a few photos and a couple of chirps from you on the chat group as, you, as we go? Or are you... Yeah, for sure. During the day? 
Yeah, so well, when I'm when I'm stopping and you know if I come across some some places, I mean once I get towards the putt stall where they have that famous little car sitting on its side and that, I'll definitely want to put the bike up against that, take a few photos, and then yeah, especially once you get down closer to the Cape where the where the where the views are beautiful and you've got the mountains and things like that, you'll probably see a lot more photos. But yeah, I'll definitely have a chat with some of the guys. They can send me some positive motivational messages. Obviously, being on my own, riding through the the freezing cold and at night. You know, all these positive messages from everyone, family, friends, all, yeah, all come in handy just to keep the spirits up. Because once you're out there, you know, you, your mind plays tricks on you thinking, why are you here? You know, you could be in bed. Why would, why would you even do this? I mean, that, that, that's the thing that sort of goes through your mind, especially when you're on your own. I mean, you yeah. did it a month or two ago and you had Paul at least by your side. So you had a bit of someone to throw ideas around and have a bit of a conversation. Whereas with me, I'm going to be yeah, at least five days, at least five days on my own pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, no, my riding partner, Paul, that is at least two words an hour. Yeah, no, that's good. That's, that's, that's <laughs> at least you had someone out. next to you. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm hoping Andy will at least, uh, you know, once I get close to the Lindley signs, you know, once once you get 30 or 40 Ks from Lindley, he'll bring me some coffee to warm me up a little bit. <laughs> unsupported, Simon, unsupported, eh? <laughs> <laughs> at least, the wa- at least the odd wave. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he might be able to shout abuse at you and wave as you go past me. <laughs> You might get some profanities from the Lindley farmer. Yeah. Um, you can show me his beer. Yeah. But, uh, no, that's great, Simon. Well, um, listen, good luck for your for the race. We'll all be rooting for you and watching you on the dot and not probably getting much yeah. work done during the during the day as a result of you. So um, have, a, have a blast there on your own. Um, as I say, you're a better man than me for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that you ride solo. I prefer to have some company, but yeah, good luck with that. And um Thanks for coming on, on, on Zoom and chatting to us. And uh, yeah, Saturday morning, 12th of June, Simon kicks off at just after, well, probably about four o'clock. Four o'clock. Shop. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere around about there and heads for first destination, Winburg, hopefully Bloemfontein on the first day. Good luck, Simon. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We'll chat soon. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Take care. We'll see you guys then. Okay, right. I think I've...